The role of capital allocators in crypto, 2019. 10 years into the era of crypto to discuss whether markets have matured to accommodate a global infrastructure with long-term growth strategies, please welcome Tushar Jain of Multicoin Capital, Paul Vera Didikit of Pantera Capital, Jalak Joban Putra of Future Perfect Ventures, Davi Wan of Privated Ventures, and your panel moderator from Crypto Briefing, Han Kao. All right, welcome everyone. All right, I guess uh, we'll, we'll go around real quick and uh, give a quick round of intros on ourselves. Uh, my name is Han Kao. I am the CEO founder of Crypto Briefing. We are a crypto media research and ratings company. Um, we've, over the past two years, published over 2,000 articles uh, and over 100 uh, reports and ratings on digital assets. And they're all uh, available for free online at cryptobriefing.com. And oh, and we're also launching a premium uh, product um, for targeting um, retail investors. Hi, I'm Jalik Jobin Putra, founder of Future Perfect Ventures. We're an early stage fund, uh, venture capital fund based here in New York, investing globally. I launched the fund in 2014 to invest in blockchain and decentralization. Hey guys, um, my name is Davi Wan, and so I'm a co-founder of Primitive Ventures. We are a full-stack uh, global crypto asset holding company, and um, so have been doing this for like, so for like uh, last few years. And like, uh, I'm board elector for Zcash, and uh, advisor to Cosmos, and like a uh, member of the advisory board on like Quandes as well. Hi everyone, my name is Tushar Jain. I'm co-founder and managing partner at Multicoin Capital. Uh, we are also investors in this space. We invest in you know, both early stage as well as already launched projects and are uh, investing in both tokens and equity uh, in this space. Hi, I'm Paul Veraditaki, a partner at Pantera Capital. Uh, we're one of the earliest institutional funds to be investing into cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Started in 2013. Um, we've invested into about 104 projects so far. I've probably done a like 98 projects in terms of investments. Um, you know, we have a venture capital fund that invests into equity. We have a ICO fund that invests into pre-sales and a digital asset fund that is long short investing into cryptocurrencies that are already on exchanges. And, you know, I'm an advisor to, you know, a good amount of companies and on the board seat of uh, a few other companies too. All right, thank you guys. Uh, welcome you guys. Uh, Paul, Tushar, Dovey, Jalak. You guys are some of the biggest crypto uh, capital allocators in crypto today. Um, it's so amazing to have you guys all here on the same panel. Uh, it's a shame we only have 30 minutes, but we'll try to uh, try to unpack as much as we can. Um, okay, so let's get started. So in the past, venture capitalists um, weren't media personalities. Uh, today you have Fred Wilson, Tim Draper, Chris Dixon, Paul Graham, uh, and any number of, of other personalities. Um, you guys all have very active social media followings and you're very active publishing research and content. Um, I'm really curious, what has changed in the role of the capital allocator uh, and, 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 and why are you guys doing what you do? A anyone with a strong opinion can start first. Um, so I can go. So I can go first. Um, I think first of all, uh, when it comes to like traditional VC, and so it's always at regional, right? And we have seen the entire probably eighty percent of the venture capital. Um, like you said, the firms are all on the same hero. Role. And but like crypto might be the first sector that Valley and US has. So it has no unfair advantage. So it's actually global by like day one. And then so how you can get better access and then so how you can get your narrative out. And then so like that's why Twitter and many other social media are like gonna help you in that way. So like there's one reason. And I think like the other reason is and as like a traditional VC and so you have the right to like, like just govern the company by the paperwork, right? But like when, but like when you are a crypto investor and then so you basically cannot influenced by the authority then you have to influence in like the other way so like that's why if you have like enough like social media like either following or just like um like impact so like they can help you a lot 
so I'd like to add on to that, and I completely agree. Um, and I think, you know, Han, you make a really good point. In the past, there were venture capitalists that were really successful that you never would have heard of uh, because they didn't need to be public. And now I think if you want to be a successful investor, especially in crypto, you have to be a public investor. You have to have a, a, a presence. And it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's extremely competitive, actually. Uh, so if you want to get the best deal flow and you want to make sure that people know who you are, you need to stay active. Memories are shorter than they've ever been. And so your brand will not sustain itself. Even if you're uh, you know, an extremely successful investor, you need to continue showing uh, that you are adding value and you're contributing back. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I want to echo Dovey's point about governance. Uh, you know, with traditional venture capital, you are governing the team. And what that means is, you know, you get a seat on the board, investors might control the board, and you can choose to hire a new CEO, you can choose to direct the roadmap through that very centralized function. But now we're not governing teams anymore, we're governing networks. And the way to govern a network is to make sure your idea gets out there and it wins the battle of ideas and that your idea wins. And that is the way to protect your investment. You know, VCs sit on boards to protect their investment, make sure what the vision that they want to have happen is happening. And so you need to have a public presence in order to do that now. Um, and then the third and final thing is, uh, you know, by being public, we are also able to help our portfolio companies because the, the same nature of the competitive atmosphere that we have is not only true of investors, there are so many competitive projects in crypto that are all going after similar markets with slightly different angles. And the biggest thing that matters is your go-to market strategy and getting people to actually build on your platform, getting people to actually use it. And so having investors that have a big public platform that can help you do that is extremely value add. Yeah, I wanna echo what uh, Tushar said in terms of, um, and you know, W2 in terms of public presence. Um, you know, we started investing into this space in 2013, so there weren't a lot of people that really just sort of had ideas of what this would look like, had theses around this space, were willing to kind of, you know, put themselves out there. And when you put yourself out there, you get a lot of criticism from it. But, you know, in a space that's still very, very early, you know, without people putting themselves out there and um, trying to push the space forward, then you don't get movement within the space. So, you know, it's really important to have people voice their ideas and opinions, and uh, it really just helps educate everyone else. Uh, secondly, I think what's pretty interesting is that Pantera now has over 100 companies. And in terms of value add, you know, we're in a unique position because we're focused on one space. We have so many portfolio companies, and they're all doing many different things that could be sort of complementary to each other, that, you know, we have a role to basically try to, you know, have companies share knowledge with each other, share resources with each other, connect with each other for business development, uh, potentially even recruit from each other, you know, M&A, et cetera. So, you know, we're putting a lot of time to really just kind of, you know, build the community and build the, the resources around it. And that's gonna help us stand out as investors. And I think, you know, value add is, is really tough and that's, that's a differentiator in the space. Thank you, Paul. Would you like? Yeah. Um Look, we're, we're very thesis driven as a fund, um, like Pantera, well, we, when we started investing, there were about three or four funds in the sector, um, worldwide investing in the sector. Um, and we went out early, uh, published, I've had a blog since 2008. Um, and while I may not be the most active on social media or Twitter these days, I think it's important to put our thesis out there, what we're interested in, so we can attract the entrepreneurs that resonate with that thesis. We're not going to be for every entrepreneur in the space, but I want them to think of us if, uh, if, if our thesis areas align. Um, I, I, um, and, and at the end of the day, what we do is for the entrepreneur and to grow the portfolio companies. And so I, I only do things or spend my time where we can uh, help the portfolio. Um, and, and, and so press helps, uh, you know, making sure that we're highlighting the work of the portfolio helps. But at the end of the day, um, a lot happens behind the scenes. And that's really the hard work of helping the companies build and grow and make introductions. And a lot of that is not in the social media sphere. Thank you, Jalek. Um, on, on that note, 
recently we've seen Elon Musk getting some hot water with the SEC. Are you guys at all concerned that the uh, deeper relationships and connections you guys make with potential retail investors can uh, potentially expose you um, on, on a legal level? That's a really interesting question. Um, I want to reframe that a little bit and, and talk about some of the entrepreneurs that we invest in, right? Because that's there's actually more, uh, you know, questions about what the actual issuer of an asset can say than an investor in that asset. Sure, fair enough. Uh, right? And so that's actually one of the things that we really focus on, on on helping our portfolio companies with is because the nature of this industry is such that you have to go public very early on. You know, the example that I always like to use is if you had to stake a share of Uber in order to drive for Uber, Uber would have been public 10 years ago, not, you know, yesterday. Um, and in crypto, that is the case. You need to have that token be public. But now you have this token, it's free floating in price. You have speculators going and buying it and selling it. You have people making price calls on your token. Uh, were you really ready for that as a CEO? Do you know how to be a public company CEO? Have you been coached? Do you have the media training? Do you know, you know what you can and cannot say? The asset may or may not be a security, but you are still you know, the representation of this network personified as the leader, right? And so your statements make an impact. And so that's something that we, that we take very seriously. And I think that uh, you know, entrepreneurs need to be very careful about in this space is those types of public statements. Because you don't want to get in hot water with any of the regulators. And also, you want to be transparent and you want to, you want to do what's right for your community. Yeah, and so for us, like internally, we consider like many of the statement or like what got Elon Musk into hot water is like direct statement about the price. And that's like a big no-no for like anything that's, you know, like it's a like, public in like the capital market. But the thing is that like, I think you as a crypto founder and one of the biggest like, like important skill set is you, so you will need to know how to run a political campaign. So it's very much like a political campaign that like all the message that you have to, you know, so you have to deliver out there. So basically you want to know how to be a very good politician. So I think what like Elon Musk has been saying is not, so it's, so it's definitely not political enough. So if like Elon is political enough and then so he can actually do much better, like when it comes to narrative and then when it, so, and then when it comes to just like the actual message like deliverables. And I think like Elon is kind of like impulsive and, but, but like we are actually Hello. So, so I think like as a, like a good crypto entrepreneur and you really want to be uh, how to be a, so like how to be a good politician and like Elon is not a good politician like Elon is a really good like creator and probably a little bit on the mass scientist side but like he's definitely not a good politician so if you know how to handle the message like a politician and then it shouldn't be an issue um, because at the end of the day especially for Leo on all these are ideological fights right and then so you want to be the cult leader like, so I, so I really don't think simply as a cult leader and you were just like talking about price directly and that's actually really dumb. Um, so like, that's my opinion. Okay, maybe, um, maybe we can cut to the next question. Did, did you really want to answer this question or? Okay. Uh, uh, no. Okay, all right. Well, let, let's, let's move on to the I next question. Stop talking about Elon Musk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's stop talking about you. Okay, so, so let's get into some meat and potatoes. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about each of your uh, long-term investments and how they may have evolved um, over the past year or two. Well, I, I can go back to uh, the last five years. So, in, you know, six, well, five, six years ago, ETH had an ICO yet. You know, Bitcoin was pretty much the only, you know, in my view, the, the uh, longer term um, uh, kind of token in town and um, was very interested in the emerging markets and the kind of thinking about macro themes, right? So we have two billion unbanked people in the world, uh, billions more underbanked, including in the United States uh, post-2008 crisis. Um, uh, all of our institutions and, and regulations were really built for the 20th century and, um, you know, we were well into the 21st century at that point. So what was going to have to change? And every 20 years, we see new technology take hold. We had the uh, PC in the, the 80s, the internet in, in the late 90s, and we were primed for something that was way more global 
and way more kind of peer to peer because of the processing power, the data collection, you know, the billions of smartphones and, and the sub $30 uh, smartphones. So I took all of that like macro themes and started investing in, in so the first applications like payments, like BitPesa, uh, invested in Abra, so finan broader financial access, um, blockchain, uh, the wallet. Um, and, and now we're very much in a different phase uh, of, you know, I think there's no question that uh, this uh, technology is going to be around. There's so many smart people getting into it. Um, so that middleware layer is very interesting. Some people will call it layer two. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the developer tools. How do we really build on top of this? Um, we're less interested in the protocol layer um, with our fund uh, versus what's going to be built on top and what's going to be used by uh, the majority of the people out there. Thank you. Yeah, so I still remember like back in the days, 2015, Paul and I, we just trade notes on, you know, blockchain as a service company. Um, so that's in the last cycle. There's a lot of such company like, um, you know, like R3, like Symbian, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, so I realized at the end of the day, those blockchain as service company has no different than any enterprise software, right? Like when it comes to enterprise software company and the valuation model is actually completely different. Um, basically, you have a typical P or, or so just P or um, uh, P or PS ratio, and and then right now in US and from the first investment like to the exit, like either IPO or um, acquisition, like on average, like takes about 6.5 years, and so so like. Like the blockchain as a service company, and I think that's actually a little bit limited, like for our so for so for the whole crypto space, because like crypto at the end of the day is actually a new coordination mechanism, right? And so we human society, and we actually organize and collaborate um, by all these as social institutions, and all the way from you know legal system to ethics and to marriage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and all these are just as social protocols. And so like all these social protocols that defines how we coordinate. And then so if you so if you think about the fundamental value of like crypto as one like not just asset, like the asset is actually the reflection of that coordination mechanism. And so so like that's why I think at the end of the day, like this thing is not just a technology. So it's a much bigger, broader um, like like promising area than like just like a vertical technology innovation. And then so like that's why I consider um, like this as a, so like this as a new so like this as a new co so coordination mechanism, and then especially we are getting into the space that um, like geopolitical tension becoming more and more fierce, right? And then like the current modern politician, and then so their job is not to form consensus, right? But like the fundamental protocol of like crypto is actually to form consensus in a very low cost basis. Um, so if we think about from that perspective, and then, um, and then we are actually getting into this like, downturn of the macro credit cycle, and we have seen Venezuela, like, which used to be the like, top country with the highest like, GBT, uh, GDP, per, uh, so GDP per capita, and then right now they're facing this currency crisis. And so when all this like, fiat currency just like, losing confidence, uh, so when like, all the citizens, like, especially for these like, emerging markets, like, losing confidence on their own fiat currency, and fiat is actually how we coordinate so in our own financial um, system, right? And so we will definitely have like Brendan Wood 2.0. And so when it comes to Brendan Wood 2.0, and then so which currency that we should decide to be the world reserve currency? So it can be US dollar, right? Because like, China not gonna agree on that. Like Europe not, not, just not gonna agree on that. So I think like crypto gonna be this like, um, like meta national like coordination mechanism, it's like a neutral zone. It's like an independent information silo that has a very low correlation so with our current fiat system. So like, that's why I think in the long term, and, and I think this is like a 20, 30 years game and probably in our generation, and we will see eventually like, like the base currency largely gonna be something neutral as a cryptocurrency. Thank you, Dobby. Oh. So I just wanna, Confirm. So the, the question is, uh, we are yeah, the, how the thesis has changed. Uh, so, what, what is your long-term thesis, and how has that changed? Okay. So, I, I mean, my long-term thesis like really matches what um, 
Dovey just said and sure, what Jalak sure. just said, so I, I won't necessarily repeat that. But I do want to talk a little bit about how it's changed, because I, th I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I think a lot of the fundamental ideas of what like, this technology is good for, like, those ideas came around a while ago. Uh, like we knew, you know, for example, like prediction markets, like that makes a lot of sense here. Like open finance, like that makes a lot of sense here. And you can see that those are some of the first projects that were started were around that. I mean, literally Bitcoin is a peer to peer cash system, right? And so, or at least according to white paper. And then, so like those types of ideas were already there. But I think what has changed for me the most and for us at Multicoin has been the timing of these things, right? So to give you some context, if you go look back at a lot of the, the failed dot-com companies from the late 90s, you know, a lot of them are now successful. I mean, it's a new company and a new team and, and, and everything else, but the idea is now successful. So timing really, really matters. Um, there, there's a, another venture capitalist that I really respect. He was a professor of mine at NYU. His name is uh, Larry Lenahan, and uh, he, he taught me a message once that uh, I'll never forget. He said, when in investing, there's a synonym for early. Wrong. And I think that's really relevant here. You need to pay attention to what is the lowest hanging fruit? What will come first? I, I happen to believe that open finance is the lowest hanging fruit for crypto and for blockchain technology. Open finance will come first. I think that'll be followed with Web3 applications that enable new use cases that were not previously possible. I think that entrepreneurs are gonna wanna build on Web3 rather than Web2 monopolies because the Web2 monopolies have consistently pulled the rug out from under them. You know, would you really go build on Facebook after what they did to Zynga? Would you go build on Google and rely your entire business on SEO after what they did to Yelp? No, why would you do that? You're gonna risk your entire business, right? And so I think Web3 is the next step. And then I think the final and longest stage step is the one that everyone always talks about and everyone thinks about is this global state-free money that um, you know, is by far the biggest vision but I also think it's the hardest to accomplish and will take the longest amount of time. Um, and if you're interested in, in our thoughts on this specifically, uh, we published a, a really long post about this that, uh, you know, just to tell you about, it's on our website, multicoin.capital. Uh, it was like two years of work that went into this, so take a look if you're interested. Thank you, Tushar and Paul. Yeah, you know, for, for us, I mean, starting five years ago, I mean, we invested in a lot of the same companies, uh, really just, you know, what you know, what is it gonna take for people to get into cryptocurrencies, whether it's domestically, whether it's internationally, there's obviously different use cases internationally than domestically. And, you know, I think, you know, along the way, we invested in ICOs, um, you know, scalability protocols, decentralized applications, uh, and then now on the venture capital side, which is just becoming more and more active, um, you know, companies are raising equity, whether they are, you know, uh, building a company that's going to get revenue or whether they are building actually a token project but they're not really quite sure how the token is going to function and they haven't gone through necessary steps to um, you know figure out you know regulations and everything like that and so I, I think what's sort of changed is pretty in line with what uh, Tushar mentioned in terms of timing you know uh, we were saying five years ago that we're going to be investing into infrastructure and even right now we're still investing into infrastructure uh, the infrastructure has sort of changed though. Uh, the infrastructure back then was just, you know, how do you get retail investors uh, into cryptocurrencies? And now it's becoming sort of, you know, more evident that institutional investors are thinking about getting into cryptocurrency. So, you know, what, what type of infrastructure is needed for institutional investors to get into cryptocurrencies where they're gonna be interested in different types of assets. Um, you know, the infrastructure's gotta look a little bit different in terms of regulations. And you know, there needs to be you know, uh, companies that are gonna be providing services uh, directly to in, uh, institutional investors. So you know, for us, a lot of focus around financial infrastructure that's going to support you know, decentralized finance. And then developer platforms, um, lots of tools for developers to actually build things on top of uh, Ethereum or other types of blockchains. And then eventually, hopefully, a lot of consumer-facing products that will leverage um, blockchain technology where consumers just don't need to know that much about cryptocurrencies or the blockchain, but they can still benefit from that without sort of, and having like a, a much better user experience. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of commonalities and um, like timing of things and whatnot, uh, but I'm also hearing a lot of um, 
different perspectives on, 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 on approach and, and capital allocation. Uh, and I think this is really an interesting indication of just how early we are in this process still uh, in blockchain uh, and that there are still uh, many different ways and perspectives on where value and value generation can come from. Um, so um, let's, let's give our audience something a little bit hardier with that. They can really sink their teeth into. What are some short and medium term um, trends that you guys are seeing right now um, in, and that you're really excited about? Well, I, I, it's, been, it's been mentioned, this, this whole idea of De DeFi or open finance. Um, and the, the way I map this out, and you know, having been an investor since 99, so invested in the early internet, <laughs> um, I, I, I've long held the view that this, this is going to be, this industry, this concept of decentralization is going to be 10x what uh, the internet provided in terms of value. because. Of, of how global it is, of, of how, um, how many people will, will now become part of the sector uh, or the, have the opportunity to invest um, you know, their skills, their, their values, uh, and, and do it in a way that is more frictionless. So um, I look at it by, by different industries, right? I mean, just like the internet disrupted finance, just like it disrupted media, um, just like it disrupted healthcare. Those are all like verticals I'm looking at, and within that, it's enterprise as well as consumer. So we, we will look at enterprise applications because, frankly, I mean, although we think everything's been digitized, like once you start looking at how much, like even in finance, is done or mortgages is, is done by fax. You know how many? I mean, I get asked for my fax number all the time um, by, by institutions. So um, there's still a lot of digitization that has to happen behind the scenes that will enable new business models to emerge, but this is not going to happen overnight. It never does, and, and this is no different. Um, you know, I remember being on this stage um, two years ago, at the, I think it was the first Ethereal conference, and. I, and and I, I was on with Brock Pierce and Joel Monegro and and you know the price of uh, the the car, uh, market cap of, of crypto had reached Netflix's uh, market cap that day and it, we were just in the beginning of this meteoric rise and um, and I you know I said it then and I, I believe in tokenization I think we hopefully we'll all be in control of our data and our own um, uh, skills and be able to transact with all of that, but that is going to be like a 20-year process. And in the meantime, it's all about investing in the infrastructure to get us there. Thank you, Jalik. I'm, I'm gonna cut, cut off to, uh, to another question. Um, <clears throat> um, let's, uh, I think we're running short on time, so let's very quickly, very, very quickly uh, go around and just very quickly say, do, you know, are there any investments that you guys um, have missed and might, might, might have regret and, uh, and, and wish you got in early? I wish I bought more Bitcoin back in like 2013. <laughs> or 2014. <laughs> or, yeah, I mean 2013 is when I discovered it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think like for us and like just, like just as the name of our like company, right, is like the whole space is so primitive and it's so early and um, like so far, like we are relatively thesisless, to be honest. And then we like, like we, so we only have like one belief, like the biggest application is the money itself. Like the money that's non seizable and that, so they can have global access. Um, so like, there, so probably there are two type of like investments out there. Like one is like crypto native and the other one is like crypto enable. Like when for all these like crypto enable, kind of like sectors, it's always just an incremental improvement, right? But the thing is that if you want to have like venture return, and so you want to hold on to, so you want to hold on to something that can be like 10x better. Um, so I think for us, and like the only thing that probably as a T-shirt was saying that we hope that we can hold on to Bitcoin and without selling it. That is, so that might be the hardest thing ever in the world, um, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.